Every gamer has a hacking story. Either we've cheated in a game ourselves, or we've faced another hacker while playing online. <laughs> well, here are seven of the best, or maybe worst, video game hacks that I know of. Oh, and real quick, if you like hearing stuff like this, I make a podcast called Darknet Diaries, which goes into depth on hacker stories just like this. So check that podcast out if you want to hear more. Number seven, Mirai. In Minecraft, you can make a private server and then create a custom world for other players to join. And the thing is, if you make a cool enough custom world, others might be interested in paying to play in it. Some of the more popular Minecraft private servers earn thousands of dollars a month from players who pay to play. Crazy, I know, but this kind of thing widens the attack surface. See, now there are lots of private servers, all making good money from Minecraft. This resulted in a botnet springing up to attack private Minecraft servers. A botnet is hundreds or thousands of infected computers all listening for commands on what to do. In this case, the attacker told the botnet to attack a private Minecraft server to make it so players couldn't connect or stay connected to those servers. Then the attacker would tell the server owners, hey, if you want us to stop the attack, pay us. Private Minecraft servers were getting hit hard. One after another was just going down. And when players couldn't connect, the servers weren't making money, resulting in thousands of dollars in losses. Some speculate that these attacks originated from rival private servers in order to get more players to their servers, which magically didn't have any problems at the same time. The botnet evolved over time and eventually became known as the Mirai botnet. The creator of Mirai was discovered and arrested. He was a college student in New Jersey. He was sentenced to 2,500 hours of community service and $8.6 million in restitution. Number six, the Half-Life 2 hacker. Half-Life 2 is a game made by Valve, and it's a single-player first-person shooter. It was set to be released in September of 2004. Half-Life 1 was amazing, so Half-Life 2 was highly anticipated, but work on the game was slow and was taking almost five years to get released. A guy named Axel Gemby couldn't wait anymore, so he hacked into Valve's network and stole the source code to Half-Life 2. And while that was probably very exciting for Axel, the story gets crazier. Once he did all that, he started posting the source code of Half-Life 2 online for anyone else to play. This was a big problem for Valve. They contacted the FBI and started investigating this immediately, but they were having a hard time figuring out who did this. But then Axel helped them out with that. See, Axel loved Valve, the video game company, so much that he called up the CEO, Gabe Newell, and admitted that he was the hacker who broke in. What's more is that he said he was still in the network. But the reason why he called is because he was asking Gabe for a job. I guess Axel thought he could impress Gabe by hacking into the network. Well, Gabe was not happy that the Half-Life 2 source code was posted to the world and was still working with the FBI to find the hacker, but here the hacker just called him on the phone asking for a job. Gabe played along, asking for a resume and stuff, and Axel gave him all his personal information. Axel Gumby was arrested and taken to court for the Valve hack. While the courts couldn't prove that Axel was the one who released the Half-Life 2 source code online, they did sentence him to two years of probation for hacking into Valve's network. Valve officially released Half-Life 2 a year later and seemingly saw no drop in sales despite the early online hacked release. Where are you free? <laughs> Let me get a look at you, man. Number five, FIFA coins. So FIFA is a soccer game or football if you aren't American and it's crazy popular. It's made by EA and in the game are these things called FIFA coins. You earn FIFA coins by playing certain matches. But man, when you play this game, you burn through these coins so fast. Everyone wants more FIFA coins. This guy, Anthony Clark, saw an opportunity. He thought there had to be a way to somehow generate FIFA coins and then sell them to players in the game for real money. The demand was definitely there, he just needed to find the supply. He worked with his friends, Nick, Ricky, and Eaton. They got a lucky break and got their hands on FIFA's source code. I'll tell you how they did that later. But with this, they were able to create a program called the FIFA Server Tool Application that would effectively play thousands of games at once. And when you play a game, you actually earn FIFA coins. So their tool would generate these FIFA coins and then send them to their master account. At their peak, Anthony, Nick, Ricky, and Eaton estimated they were earning about 67 million FIFA coins every hour. They ran this gambit for two years, starting in 2013 and finally getting caught in 2015. In February of 2016, Anthony was officially convicted of wire fraud by the Texas Department of Justice. He was stressed out from the arrest and awaiting sentencing. 
According to his family, he was researching which federal prisons had the best school options, and was later found dead from what I believe to be an accidental overdose, a mix of alcohol and medication. And that was on February 26, 2016, a mere two days before his sentencing. He was said to have a net worth of $4 million at the time of his death. And because of his death, his charges were dropped and his sentence was never delivered. Number four, Team Executor. Team Executor was a group of hackers known for their ability to hack consoles to play pirated versions of video games. So imagine playing a PlayStation game on an Xbox, or to be able to bypass anti-privacy protections on a Nintendo Switch. They were hacking all the major consoles, and once they gained access to these systems, they then sold the pirated versions of the games to players, making millions of dollars in this process. Team Executor didn't just upload the source code online for all to see and use, they went so far as to create their own section of the market. They created an online database where players could download pirated versions of popular games, and they even created their own hardware that came preloaded with these pirated versions of games. Team Executor spent a lot of time and effort making their pirated versions look and feel like the real thing, coming up with creative but official sounding names for their devices like the Gateway 3DS, or the Stargate, or the True Blue Mini. They even made attachments for these Nintendo devices which also sounded legit, like there was the SX line that included the SX OS, and the SX Pro, and the SX Lite, and the SX Core. These names in the About Us section on their website were intended to make the public believe they were a legitimate company and team working hand in hand with large companies. With Nintendo Switch, they even created hardware that would automatically connect the gamer to Team Executor's suite of games, bypassing Nintendo Switch's network entirely, but then making the user pay a licensing fee in order to play Team Executor's games. Ultimately, the members of Team Executor were arrested and charged with fraud on August 20th, 2020 sentencing is still being determined. Number three, Manfred. Manfred loves massive multiplayer online games, but like many of us, he would get bored after playing them for a while. But he was a programmer, so he would start poking at the game to see if he could get it to do things it wasn't supposed to do. This led him to manipulate the packets that the game client was sending to the game server. So like when he was in the game and he would pick up one gold piece off the ground, he might capture that packet and tell the server, actually I picked up one million gold pieces off the ground. But then the server would be like, no, error. Uh, okay, well that didn't work. So then he tried telling the server, actually I picked up negative one gold pieces off the ground. And zing, instantly he had 32 million gold in his inventory. And he would find glitch after glitch doing things like this. Another thing he was good at is finding dupe bugs. This is where you can take like a bag of items, hand it to another player, then crash your client before the game saves. So when you log back in, you still have the bag, but the other player has theirs too. He found vulnerabilities like this in Ultima Online, Dark Age of Camelot, Anarchy Online, Lineage 2, Final Fantasy Online, World of Warcraft, Lord of the Rings Online, Shadowbane Online, Rift Online. Okay, you get the picture. At first, he would just use these abilities to grief other players or cheat to win. But after a while, he learned that he could make some serious money from doing this. Other players wanted his gold and items, and he could just create it out of thin air. So he started selling it, and he was bringing in really good money this way, by selling gold in bulk to Chinese sellers who would then sell it to players directly. After 20 years of doing this, as his full-time job without getting caught, Manfred has now moved away from hacking online games. He's now totally white hat and works for a security assessment company. I interviewed Manfred for my podcast, Darknet Diaries. It's episode seven and eight if you want to hear more. Number two, the thinning of H1Z1. In January 2015, Daybreak Games released H1Z1. It's a first person shooter, but it was so buggy that there became an entire second market dedicated just to cheats and hacks for the game. You could get aimbots or auto-aim, which makes killing opponents a lot easier, or ESP add-ons, which would allow players to see through walls or around buildings, or to show the exact location of other players. These cheats and others like them became so rampant in the game that Daybreak's president, John Smedley, decided to crack down on the cheaters. He tweeted, You don't think we know about these cockroaches? We do, and we're going to be relentless and public. After that, Daybreak started banning people, and it wasn't just one at a time. Literally overnight, Daybreak banned 25,000 cheaters from H1Z1. Then more bans swept through. There was wave after wave of bans. There were over 30,000 players banned in total. But there was a caveat. Any one of the players that were banned could be unbanned 
if they uploaded a public apology video. So was there a massive amount of public apologies for players itching to get back into H1Z1? Nope, not even close. Despite the game being out only a few months, nobody was really jumping at the chance to get unbanned from the game. As we've seen with people like Manfred, once players get to do anything they want in the game, it's no longer fun to play it normally. Only a handful of apology videos were ever uploaded. The first apology video posted proved that Daybreak would keep the word. Instead of avoiding the problem, I became part of the problem. I don't want to apologize to Daybreak. All my fellow gamers. Yeah, I, I messed up. The player uploaded their apology and then got unbanned from H1Z1, allowing them to play the game again. However, based on another tweet from John Smedley, this person didn't learn their lesson and were well on their way to getting banned again. It makes me think though, who's not learning their lesson here? Is it Daybreak or the cheaters? Number one, Xbox Underground. Okay, this story. Uh, th this story is so insane you're not gonna believe it, but it checks out. I've talked with these guys personally and combed through their court records to fact check this. So there was this group of guys who were hacking Xboxes. Basically, they were taking it apart physically and making it do things that it just shouldn't have been able to do. And this leads them to a developer version of Xbox Live, which is a place where devs can put unreleased games or expansions for beta testers to test out. So here they start playing all sorts of stuff that nobody else should be able to play. But that wasn't enough. This group found one of the passwords to Epic Games Network Administrator and was able to log into Epic's network. From there, they saw the source code to Gears of War before it was released and grabbed it. The group kept this secret amongst themselves, but this was such a rush and such a thrill that they kept going. They found more passwords to other game company admins and devs and tried to log in to other game studios. One after another, they were gaining access to all the major game studios and grabbing source code for unreleased games. In their three-year reign, they gained access to Microsoft, Activision, Valve, Epic Games, EA, Bungie, Blizzard, Zombie Studios, Disney, Intel, and a bunch of other game maker networks. Each time they got into one, it would allow them to pivot into another. Oh, and here is where Anthony Clark got the source code for FIFA. See, he was involved with this group too, but once he got the FIFA source code, he mainly focused on that. The collective goal of the group was just to get access to games nobody else could play, or early access to unreleased games, and they kept the secret just to themselves. That was until they started getting reckless, and people weren't following the code anymore, and got careless. Stuff started leaking online, and as you can imagine, the more careless they got, the closer the FBI got to them. In the end, a lot of them were caught and served time, but seriously, I'm not doing this story justice here. Grab your phone, install a podcast player, and subscribe to Darknet Diaries, and listen to episodes 45 and 46. I interview three of the guys involved there, and it's just insane what they did. And there's so many crazy hacking stories on this podcast, so if you like this video, I'm sure you're gonna like the podcast. See you there.